very good morning to everybody. Firstly, I want to, I want to congratulate all the organizers and my dear friend, uh, Mrs. Ishi Khosla for organizing this wonderful event on gut health. Now, what I'll be speaking about is uh, from the perspective of a medical doctor who decided to come into the field of preventive healthcare and understand preventive healthcare from a concept of uh, nutrition, and how the body heals itself. My understanding about healing is rooted in uh, some bit of modern medicine, but a large part uh, as a medical doctor when I started reading the ancient Vedic scriptures and how the body and health was defined in the Vedic scriptures. Now, according to the Vedic scriptures, how it defined the body was slightly different than how we as medical doctors understand the definition of a human body. So human body is not just flesh and bones. It's not just about what we see as a physical liver or a kidney or an intestine or a gut. It is powered by many other layers of what we call as a being. Now, as a medical doctor, for me, initially, this was hard to understand because we are used to some things which we can touch, feel, hold and see with our physical eyes. But it's hard for us to understand things which we don't uh, see under a microscope or don't see with our eyes. And therefore, to understand how the gut impacts health, we have to first understand how the ancient wisdom understood health and the human body. The ancients understood health in a more holistic and integrated way. That means they did not only talk about intestine or a heart or a kidney, even though they could see because uh, dissections and dead bodies were being uh, dissected even at early times to see what is inside the human body, bones and flesh and everything else. But how does this work? How does the intestine work? Where is this consciousness coming from? So the root of health was rooted in consciousness, was rooted in intelligence, which was not something you could... Uh, just locate in a liver or a kidney or an intestine. So gut health took the form of intelligence. Of course, today in modern medicine, we do talk about the gut intelligence and the gut brain access. But ancients knew thousands of years back that the physical body might be the working machine, but there's something beyond the physical body which is powering that machine. And how does that power work to keep the body healthy and what are those things which make the body unhealthy was what they talked about. So physically, how the physical body is powered was understood as the breath. The breath powers the human body. And therefore, when the breath goes wrong or when we do shallow breathing or when we do breathing which is not conducive to a balanced health, that's where diseases start. And therefore, why the breath was given so much importance, because the human body was not just seen as physical flesh, but it was seen as energy, which was powering the human body. And that energy was understood as the life energy. And therefore, the flow of breath was considered paramount. The, the correct flow of breath was considered paramount when we talk about human health. Now, when we talk about breath, or the life energy flowing through the body. We also know that in terms of anxiety, stress, breath is the first thing which goes out of balance. And we feel in the pit of the stomach, literally, anxiety or fear. And that's where the energy systems go out of balance. And therefore, in the Vedic system, great care was given to A, how do you build the body? How do you construct the body? What are the elements which construct the body? And then once the body is constructed in the right way, the right elements are there, how does the breath flow within that body easily? Because the physical body was considered the, the tangible portion through which the breath flowed. And therefore it was considered more like a energy system conducting that energy. Of course, in the physical body, it was not just about everybody should eat apple or everybody should eat bananas or everybody should eat roughage. No, it was very, very personalized. And not only personalized because every one of us is very unique, 
but also personalized to a greater extent. And that personalization started first with understanding uh, one's own unique body type which was made of the same elements as are found in on earth, which is whether it is water or whether it's earth or whether the minerals of earth. But it was also considered critical that how the body is interacting with food, which is another part of earth. The fruit is uh, from earth. The trees draw their nutrients from earth. The trees and the leaves draw their nourishment from the hydration, from the sunlight. And this was very deeply understood that the interrelation between the environment and the end product, which is a plant or a vegetable or, or what is the fruit of earth and who is consuming it, the human being is consuming it. So in what way it should be consumed? It was not just enough to say, drink milk or have clarified butter. It was also important to know how do you eat it? Eating meaning, how do you cook it? How do you combine it with other food elements? At what time of the day you should eat it? What is the weather with which it will work? And what is your life cycle? Are you a child? Are you an elderly person? And how it will be digested? Meaning thereby that food was not understood in a limited sense of just having a couple of carbs or proteins or amino acids. It was understood as a dynamic thing. When I say dynamic thing, it means that how is the body constitution? Then what is the age? Is it a child? Is it a youth? Is it an elderly person? What is the season? How is the food being uh, handled? That means is it roasted? Is it being dried? Is it being fried? Is it being steamed, boiled? Everything was mentioned. How is it combining with other foods? Is milk being, con uh, milk being combined with watermelon? No, that was forbidden. Is milk being combined with cherries or, or citrus fruits? No, it was forbidden. Is honey being heated? It was forbidden. That means the unique biochemical reaction which happens when two foods combine was also studied in great detail. In fact, what is amazing is that something as common and popular as milk was studied in great detail. That means camel's milk was different than cow's milk was different than goat's milk was different than buffalo's milk was different than cow's milk. In fact, some scriptures have gone to the extent of saying that if somebody wants to have a fine brain, they should avoid buffalo milk. So milk and its impact and different animals and their milk and then impact on the human body was studied. In fact, great detail had been studied whether people who were eating uh, foods like birds from the marshy land or from the dry uh, areas or from the uh, mountainside, even the flesh of that bird or that meat or that was described that what would be the impact on the human body. Which means when we talk about gut health, the ancient acharyas or the, or the teachers and the Veds who were given the responsibility of diagnosing and treating patients were different. The acharyas were training and teaching, and the Veds were uh, treating and correcting the disorders and guiding the, the, the public. So certain uh, formulas or rules were given. Much of what we understand as Ayurveda today is very little of actually what Ayurveda was in actuality. Ayurveda was about prolonging health and longevity of a human being. It was not about giving medicines only. Medicines were considered a small part of this whole science of Ayurveda, which is a long life, which is protecting the life and the health of the individual. And therefore, many, uh, uh, many instructions or directions or cause and effects were given. And these cause and effects were defined according to what is the goal of eating, that means, is the goal of eating uh, for a warrior would be very different from a scholar, would be very different from somebody who was uh, more uh, into day-to-day -day, uh, physical hard work, which means that it was not just one diet for everyone. It was not just everybody eat 2,000 calories because it's healthy for you and have a protein or a carb. No, it was very, very defined and personalized to the kind of occupation, the profession. And, and the occupation and profession was not only about being sedentary or being, uh, uh, you know, doing hard manual labor. 
It was also about whether your uh, work needed you to be more in the lines of administration or a warrior or a scholar or a learner. So, so the, the definition of what the food could do with you or would do to you was basis also what is your goal in life? What is that you are doing in life? And, and how would you use the food and end towards that goal? Of course, there are a lot of recipes and, and, and a lot of people understand Ayurveda only as vegetarian and sattvic food, which is not true. Ayurveda was about, it was a science. It talked about cause and effect. So there are many recipes of alcohol in Ayurveda. There are many recipes of different kinds of pickles in Ayurveda. There are different recipes of different kinds of plants and foods and animal and different things. And therefore, food was understood in its deepest personalized scientific way and the effect it had on the human body and accordingly people could choose what they wanted to eat and depending on uh, how they were handling their bodies like for example it was uh, explained that how uh, the same product say curd in different seasons either would work very well or actually become harmful for the body so the same product occurred uh, even if we, let's say, from the same animal, let's say a cow's curd um, made from cow's milk, uh, in rainy season would have a different impact. In the dry, uh, hot summers would have a different impact. Even the kind of curd, was it like a whole curd or was it just the whey protein or the whey of the curd or was it the cheese which was made from curd, uh, from milk? So everything was defined in such great detail that it's amazing the power of observation and the power of scientific reasoning and logic, which was applied to the art of eating. So Ayurveda has a large portion which dedicated itself to the art and science of eating. And the kitchen was not just about just filling the bellies. It was almost like a laboratory where different combinations, whether it is called decoction, like cinnamon, uh, cardamom, ginger, holy basil, they were made into various decoctions for every possible kind of health or ill health, which means whether it was upper respiratory tract infection, whether it was uh, uh, to set an indigestion in order, or whether it was to uh, even rejuvenate. Anti-aging was a very large part which has been described in Ayurveda in great details again, that how does the body rejuvenate and, and what is the way of anti-aging through all these decoctions. And these decoctions were also of different kinds. Some were some herbs were first fermented and then they were converted into decoction. Some were just seeped in hot water. Some were even allowed to just seep in plain water. And so all these fermentations, formulas, which were created, were created because of a deep understanding between the external world, whether it's plants or animals, the internal world, which is the human body, and the environment, which was constantly changing and evolving with seasons, with time. So when we talk about gut health, I think it's really nice uh, and important to note here that ancient Veds, or the doctors as they were called, uh, looked at a couple of things. They looked at the stool, that what is the nature of the stool? What is the nature of the bowel movement? Uh, they also looked at the tongue to see uh, how the tongue is, how healthy it is. They looked at the white, the sclera of the eyes. They looked at the pulse. They looked at the condition of the skin, the hair. So they not only looked at uh, just one parameter, they looked at the entire body as a machine or as a spiritual machine, let's say, the physical body and the spiritual body together. How was it handling food? And therefore, a lot of diseases they could diagnose much before they became manifest simply by what they called as the pulse diagnosis. So they saw the pulse and they saw the variation. They saw the disturbances in the energy system. And they could say that if this energy system has been so disturbed, what are the probable diseases this person will get? Of course, today we are lucky and fortunate to have great diagnostics in terms of whether it's radiology or blood tests. But we must also remember that when we look at a blood test or radiology, it should not be only seen in isolation. It should be seen in a holistic manner, which means that we just don't look at a blood sugar reading, which is high and say, okay, here's the medicine, or, uh, and you're, or you're a diabetic. 
we also have to see that along with the high blood sugar, is triglyceride high? Is the liver also become fatty? Is the digestive system, that means, uh, is there inflammation in the liver? Are the liver enzymes rising? And we don't just treat a blood sugar, we treat the body. We treat the digestive system. And the, the most important thing which I would like to play, uh, like to state here as a medical doctor uh, who studied modern medicine, but finally uh, decided to move into holistic health and healing was that the ancient systems define the body as a, uh, as a healing, the body having the power to heal itself, body having the power to regenerate itself, rejuvenate itself, and therefore to unlock those powers a lot was written about. How is it relevant in the modern times? It couldn't be more relevant in the modern times. Today, what do we see? We see that there is a huge influx of chemical foods, foods which are less normal, less natural, and more chemical, biosimilars, whether it is artificial color, artificial preservatives, pesticides, uh, or they are packaging, plastic packaging. So we are being inundated with chemicals from every possible area, not only the time the food grows, whether it is in, uh, in agriculture practices, but also the way it is processed, the way it is packaged. So right from plastic seeping from the packaging to the water, the, the pesticides and the chemicals which are in the water on which these plants are growing. So it is no surprise that gut disorders are rising, allergies are rising, infertility is rising, cancers are rising and many other conditions uh, which are connected to lowered immune response is rising. And it is very, very clear to, for us to see that the human body, which was designed to eat natural organic food or food which was made in the most natural form is now getting mixed up with a lot of chemicals which the body was not designed to either eat or digest. And therefore the gut health is the first stop or the first step which we need to fix if you want to fix anything right from cancer to infertility. Because if the gut health is not there, it is almost impossible to fix any other part of the body. The entry gate to our, to our whole system is the gut. And therefore, I'm so glad this conference is happening because it is pointing towards the most important doorway to health, which is our gut. Hello, Dr. Natasha. It's great to have you for this today uh, session. Thank you very much for it, and thank you for taking out your time from a Thank you for inviting. Yeah, thank you for inviting. People talk about gut brain access, correct? People talk about a lot of people have been talking. A lot of evidence has been coming about gut brain access. So, uh, and we have a topic on ADD, ADHD, and autism. So, I just wanted to know what is this gut brain access? Whole thing about gut brain access. Can you explain to us that simply? And uh, why it is so important? Absolutely. Human body is a microbial community. There are more microbes inside your body than there are human cells. Mm -hmm. And the headquarters of this microbial community is in the digestive system, in the gut. More than 90% of all those microbes are in your digestive system. It's the big ministry, the big headquarters, the commanding echelons of all of your microbiome are there in the gut. The reason for it is because we put food into our digestive system. If you ask any microbiologist what is the most powerful influence on the microbial community in nature, the answer will be food. There is nothing more powerful, food. You change food supply to a group of microbes and everything will change within hours. Certain species of microbes will disappear, other microbes will appear and the whole microbial community will change. That is why the commanding center of our whole body is in the digestive system because more than 90% of you are microbes. And these microbes in your digestive system produce hormones, produce neurotransmitters, produce endorphins, and they digest the food that you eat and convert it into millions of various chemicals. Mm -hmm. Many of these chemicals are good for us. And uh, as long as your gut flora is healthy and well-balanced, these microbes produce good chemicals for you and you feel well and you have energy and you have no illnesses. Problem is in our modern world, 
We live in an environment where our gut flora gets damaged all the time. Agricultural chemicals, many of them are antibiotics in their nature. They kill microbes, many microbes. Then uh, additives in our food, additives in our water, pollution, general pollution in the environment, all sorts of things. So they damage the balance in the gut, in the digestive system, because any microbial community functions on balance. They have to be all the microbes present there. There should be fungi, bacteria, viruses, protozoa, all sorts of creatures. And when they're together and they balance each other, they control each other. They don't allow anyone to cause trouble. But when you keep eating antibiotics, because you're buying your food in a supermarket, for example, or you're eating other chemicals which kill microbes, <clears throat> you're, breaking that dam you're breaking that balance all the time. No antibiotic in the world can kill everything. They can only kill a certain group of microbes. Once you've taken those out, they were controlling a myriad of other creatures. These creatures suddenly are not controlled anymore. They overgrow, they take large territories in your digestive system, and the balance is gone. The harmony is gone. And what used to be good for you, the microbes that used to serve you very well in a balanced community, in an unbalanced community, start causing trouble. They digest food in their own way. They start converting it into many, many poisons. They start producing too much serotonin or too much dopamine or not enough. Or there are more than 200 various uh, neurotransmitters which are manufactured in the digestive system and then transported to the brain for the brain to use. And if the gut flora is un abnormal, unbalanced, then it produces abnormal amounts of neurotransmitters. Some are not enough, some are too much, and the whole balance is gone. But when your brain receives this mixture of abnormal neurotransmitters, it responds, <clears throat> it reacts. So your mood gets abnormal, your behavior changes, you may become depressed, or you may develop anxiety, or obsessive compulsive disorder, or memory lapses, or something else. So, or you may not sleep well, you know, all sorts of things can happen. So that is one connection between the gut and the brain. Another connection is hormones. Our brain is very hormone dependent organ. And uh, every microbe in the gut produces its own hormones. In fact, the endocrine research into gut flora now shows that it's the biggest endocrine organ in our bodies, the most powerful. So this flow of hormones coming out of your digestive system, they talk to our hormonal organs, to our endocrine system. They talk to your thyroid hormones, adrenal hormones, sex hormones, and other hormones that your body produces, and they can upset the balance in your body. Hormones are very powerful molecules. They affect every function, every cell, every organ in your body in a very complex way. And the brain is no exception. The brain is very much affected by the hormonal balance in the body. And when these hormones are abnormal, you start getting psychological problems, mental problems, and neurological problems. The brain responds. So these are just two connections. Then we have a vagal nerve. That's one of the biggest nerves in the human body. It comes from the brain down and it goes to practically every internal organ in the body. Not only it sends commands to these internal organs how to work properly, but it also collects information from those organs. When this disaster is happening in your digestive system, that information is collected from your in, uh, intestinal organs and passed into the brain and the brain responds accordingly to that information. So that will bring more imbalances and more psychological problems and, and more trouble. And uh, what happens with small children? When a child, uh, a baby, gets abnormal gut flora and children inherit their gut flora from the parents, from the mother and the father. We have now generations of people in the world who have abnormal gut flora because of the environment we've created, because of all the chemicals in our food, in our water, in our environment, everywhere. So the mother and the father pass damaged, abnormal gut flora to their baby. So the baby starts life from a very poor point as a result. They have abnormal gut flora, these children. What this abnormal gut flora does, lots of microbes, they become pathogenic. They damage the integrity of the gut wall in a baby, in a child, making it porous and leaky. Big holes develop in the gut wall, literally big holes. At the same time, this abnormal gut flora digests the food in the wrong way, converting it into many, many toxic, poisonous chemicals, which will absorb through this leaky gut, through these holes in the gut wall. At the same time, they produce many toxins of their own, these microbes. So this baby, instead of being nourished by the digestive system, gets poisoned 
by their own digestive system. This flow of toxicity, this river of toxicity coming from the gut, reaches the brain, gets inside the brain, clogs the brain with toxicity. As a result, the child cannot develop appropriately. The child's brain does not develop appropriately. The most severe situation is autism. That these children are very toxic and their brains are very poisoned. From my professional point of view, 100% of modern autistic children were born with a perfectly normal brain. These were perfectly normal babies, but they got poisoned by their own gut flora. Poisoned by the food that gets digested by this gut flora abnormally and converted into millions of poisonous chemicals. Their brain is clogged with toxicity, that is why the child is autistic. If the level of toxicity is different and the mixture of chemicals is different, then the child may not become autistic, but will become hyperactive, develop attention deficit disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, dyslexia, dyspraxia, epilepsy. The list is very long. A new diagnosis come out all the time. So that is the connection between the gut and the brain. That is the gut-brain axis. Absolutely. The leaky gut is when the gut wall is, talk, is, is porous and leaky. And things which should not absorb, suddenly absorb. What happens? Our gut lining is lined by very specialized cells called enterocytes, the epithelial cells. And these cells only live a couple of days. They have a very short life. They work very hard. They get born very deep, deep, deep in the gut lining. And then they travel up the villi, getting more mature on the way and fulfilling many functions for us. They take a crucial role in proper digestion of food and proper breakdown of food. And uh, on their sides, they've got like Velcro. They're attached to each other, like with a Velcro on the sides. Trouble is, these pathogenic microbes in the gut of these children and adults develop chemicals, produce special chemicals, which break that Velcro. They damage it. So the cells are not attached anymore to each other. They, they separate from each other. And holes develop in the gut lining. Normally, food gets digested, and then these cells swallow that food inside themselves, analyze it, make sure that it's safe, and then they release it from the other end into your bloodstream to be spread out the, 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 around the body. But when this Velcro is broken between them, and the gut wall opens to invasion, it becomes porous, holes develop in there. Food doesn't get the chance to be digested properly before it absorbs. It absorbs undigested. And then the immune system finds these undigested bits of food, looks at them in the blood, in the lymph, and says, you're not food, I don't recognize you as food, and attacks them. And this attack of the immune system manifests as a food allergy or intolerance. Many, many symptoms can be the result of this food allergy or intolerance. Can be a panic attack, can be a drop in your blood sugar level, it can be a drop in your energy, you can feel dizzy, or you can develop a skin rash, or you can have an asthma attack. Or you can have cystitis, or you can have eczema, or psoriasis, or um, rheumatoid arthritis, or anything you like. Painful joints, painful bones, painful muscles. Any symptom can be developed as a result of this food allergy and intolerance. People go and do testing for food allergies and intolerances and find that, you know, I should remove these foods and I should remove those foods and so on. And they start removing foods and removing foods until there's nothing left to eat. And they're still reacting. Because the problem is not with the food. The problem is with your gut lining. As long as your gut lining is like a sieve and it has holes in it, you can be sure you're absorbing everything undigested and you're reacting to everything. Yeah. So what we do with the GAPS nutritional protocol, with the GAPS diet, we heal and seal that gut lining. We rebuild it anew. We build new layers of healthy enterocytes and we close up all those holes. And once the gut lining has healed itself and sealed itself, you start digesting your food properly, absorbing it properly, and your food allergies and intolerances disappear. So apart from the food, this leaky gut will also let through other things. Alive microbes will get through and get circulated all over your body, pathogenic, uh, parasitic larvae will be all over your body, and the, the toxic chemicals that are produced by pathogenic microbes in the gut. So in people with a leaky gut like that, their digestive system, instead of feeding them, instead of being a source of nourishment for them, becomes a major source of toxicity in the body. And when this toxic river, wherever it gets to in your body, it will cause disease in your brain, in your joints, in your muscles, in any organ, anywhere. So, so working on the gut and working through your diet, GAPS diet, 
how how effective is it for children with add adhd and autism asd is it, is it is it something a must for every kid or is it absolutely, only for absolutely. the kids who have, is it only for the kids who have gut symptoms because a lot of kids have gut symptoms but some of them don't have from my clinical point of view the short answer is yes every autistic child every hyperactive child every child with other learning disabilities and other developmental problems should be on the gaps diet the beauty of the gaps diet is that it, you don't have to be on it for the rest of your life you can heal your gut it takes minimum 2 years to heal your gut to rebuild it for all the symptoms to clear to disappear and then gradually you can reintroduce foods which you didn't have before for example rice for people in india i know that rice is your staple and it's difficult to give up for many people but for 2 years you can give it up and give up on wheat and other things and then human body uh, every one of us is unique and every one of us in our human bodies has strong points constitutionally strong points and weak points if your digestive system your strong point constitution in your body the body will work around the problem it will not give you symptoms in the digestive tract there will be symptoms elsewhere maybe you'll have eczema flaring eczema or migraines or, or something else uh, but the yeah. gut seems to be all right so from my point of view every chronic disease begins in the gut there is no healing without changing your diet perfect great great so the i you just said that the gaps died at least for 3 years so i just wanted to know that after 3 years when you stop gaps died do they relapse children with autism with the add adhd do they relapse or they what happen do they recover completely and then they don't have any even sub syndromal features or, or how do they how do they go ahead further well minimum we stay on the gaps diet for 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 2 years for yeah. 2 years minimum and that is for people who don't have very severe situations an autistic mm. child who has recovered from autism and we have many many children in the world who have recovered from autism um once they recover they do have to stay more or less on the gaps diet but if a family goes on holiday somewhere and they want to have some ice cream and they want to have what what's available there they can't do it for a week or two and the child will survive that there won't be many reactions and there won't be much going on and many foods can be introduced to the child after the child has recovered with autism what i have to say it's very important for people to understand that uh, autistic children up to the age of 4 four and a half maximum five can recover fully from autism all the children will still remain autistic but there will be improvements and improvements can be very dramatic depends on how much effort you want to put into education of that child into teaching that child because when we do pet scans with three year old autistic children we find a perfectly normal brain on the scan when we do a pet scan with a 23 year old autistic individual we find that the brain is seriously damaged there are many areas which have atrophy in them and there is uh, physical damage to the tissue of the brain what happens here that child was born with a perfectly normal brain but he or she acquired abnormal gut flora from mommy and daddy and that abnormal gut flora poisoned the child and that toxicity that th those poisons got into the brain and uh, clogged the brain with toxicity and made the child autistic the immune system then tries to join in in the brain and clean it up and constantly try to clean it up causing inflammation in the brain causing autoimmunity in the brain and the longer that activity that bombardment of toxicity and the activity of the immune system goes on in the brain the more physical damage is inflicted on the tissue of the brain so if uh, if 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 a, if a parent has one child with autism or on the neurodevelopment disorders or in the spectrum what mothers were risk for a autism spectrum neurodevelopment disorders what precautions or what can they do and they want to go with the second child and a lot of time they ask what can we do to prevent in the second child we you know there's 10 to 30% risk is there and you know whether a second child will have we want to have one more child for, to accompany the child we want to we are still young you know can we do it so absolutely so, absolutely, so, absolutely. So in that, in very good question is, yeah so what 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 the mothers can do and that is one of the very frequent question which is asked by parents by when when they come to me and when they are planning for the second one mm -hmm. we have on mygapstraining.com we have a, a special course for these parents the baby course it's 2 or 3 months and if you go on that course you will learn everything there is to know and your individual questions will be answered by very experienced gaps practitioners 
about your first child, about your individual situations, whatever illnesses you may have, uh, what, what your health history, the father's health history, and your environment that you live in. All of these things are important. What we have to take into account, that apart from gut flora, the parents also pass their toxic load to their baby. It sounds cruel, it sounds unfair, but the way the mother nature designed a woman's body is that the woman's body uses pregnancy as a chance to clean up. We live in a polluted world. Little girls start accumulating toxins from the environment from literally very, very young age. And by the time a woman is ready to have her first baby, her body is full of toxins. Because our chemical industry has produced more than 100,000 different new chemicals to date, which do not exist in nature. When they get into your body, these chemicals are everywhere. They're in your shampoo, in your hair dyes, in your personal care products, in your fire retardants, in your bedding, in your clothes, in your towels, in the air, everywhere. But when they get into your body, very often the body cannot neutralize them. The body just stores them, tucks them away somewhere, making them safe and stores them. And when the woman gets pregnant, the body thinks, great, I'll clean up. And it dumps the lot into the developing baby. So the child is born with a high toxic load as a result. The father unloads a lot of toxicity. The fathers are not exempt. They unload a lot of toxicity out of their body through semen. That is a major venue for a man to cleanse his body, the semen. And semen goes into the woman, and the woman will absorb his toxicity too. So that's how both the mother and the father contribute their toxic load to the baby. So our babies in the modern world are being born with a growing toxic load. My dear friends, it is a pleasure to be here with you. And I am very thankful to the organizers, especially Ishiji, for giving me the opportunity to speak and to be with you. First and foremost, I want to mention that everything in nature is interconnected because everything is complementing everything else. And therefore, a malfunction or deficiency anywhere in the system is going to impact the entire system. And the same is true of the gut because the gut is connected to all the, all the organs and the systems in the body, the heart being no exception. This, of course, there's a lot of research behind this now. Now, the gut has to be in a state of good health for it to be able to affect the other systems. And for that, it is dependent on the gut microbiome, the status of the gut lining, vitamins, minerals, energy, the vagus nerve, as well as the mind. Now, the Connection between these organs occurs because of the vagus nerve, which is the connecting link. This is a very large nerve starting from the brain. As it crosses down, it supplies the face, the neck, the chest, including the heart and the lungs, the gut, including the intestines, the stomach, the liver, the pancreas, the spleen, and the kidneys. So about 80% of impulses flow from these organs to the brain and about 15% from the brain downwards to these organs. But all of them are interconnected, and the gut is de therefore is uh, you know, largely dependent on the function of the vagus nerve. Now, I mentioned about the gut microbiome. A lot is going to be talked about in this symposium, so I will not spend much time on that. Suffice to say that the function of the gut microbiome is so important that it impacts our entire health, and it carries on multiple functions. The gut microbes are of many types, but basically what we want are the uh, increase in the good bacteria, the good microbes, and as less as possible, the bad ones. Now, the good ones are now being impacted very badly because of lots of things, especially the food we eat. For example, wheat, corn, soy, sugar, milk, preserved food, fast food, frozen food, antibiotics, PPIs, contraceptives, sleeping pills, corticosteroids, cytotoxic drugs, infections, a lot of stress, alcohol, chemicals, radiation, pollution. There's so many things which are impacting the, the gut microbes. Now, because of that, when the gut microbes, the good gut bacteria get damaged, then it leads to a very important condition called leaky gut. I'm talking about excessive leaky gut because a little bit is important for us. Uh, a lot is going to be talked about. You've already heard a lecture by Dr. Sood on this. So I will not spend too much of time on that. But I would like to mention that when there is this excess leaky gut, then as it is obvious, 
the food does not get digested properly. Therefore, we become deficient in vitamins, minerals, as well as proteins and amino acids. And this, of course, becomes a source of very, very chronic uh, inflammation. And this inflammation then leads to a damage of the blood vessels, which we label as endothelial dysfunction, which then further leads to hypertension, atherosclerosis, as well as heart disease. Now, we know there are lots of causes of heart disease as I enumerated, as you can see on the left, like hypertension, diabetes, pre-diabetes, obesity, sedentary lifestyle, bad eating habits, stress, and all that. Now, all of these lead to one important thing, and that is inflammation. So inflammation is the basic root cause of all chronic conditions, including the heart. Cholesterol is not an important reason for that at all, and I'll discuss this a little later, but I would like to mention that things, chronic diseases like hypertension, diabetes, pre-diabetes, obesity, and many more are a result of what is known as insulin resistance. You keep hearing about this a lot of times, but very briefly I want to mention that insulin resistance is a condition where the cells of the body, especially those of the liver, those of the, the, the fat cells and the muscle cells, they do, not, they do not perform as well as they ought to to the, to the effect of insulin, as a result of which a lot of glucose accumulates in the body. And this glucose accumulation then leads to inflammation. Now, inflammation, again, you, you keep hearing about this inflammation. Basically, acute inflammation is a protective phenomenon because it leads to repair and regeneration of the body and it is a result of infection and so many other, other causes, so many factors bring it about. But if this becomes chronic and the reparative process slows down, cannot keep pace with the acuteness of the inflammation or the infection, then it leads to, it becomes chronic. And this chronic inflammation is the cause of practically all, all diseases. And this can happen because of in, ingestion of wheat, milk, sugar, and all the factors I mentioned leading to uh, leaky gut, in addition to insulin resistance as well. So what is the most important cause of this? Now, there are many causes of inflammation, but every human being gets inflammation and leaky gut if they eat wheat. Now, I'm quoting Dr. Tom O'Brien here, and this, the, the, the inflammation being a cause, was detected way back in 1986. Now, what is there in modern wheat which is so harmful? It has a lot of proteins which our gut cannot digest, like gliadins, it has wheat germaglutinin, it has gluten, it also has a protein called amylopectin A. Amylopectin A is also present in other foodstuffs like maize, rice, sugar and potatoes. What it does is it brings about production of small and dense LDL. I'll discuss this later. But please remember that small and dense LDL is the basic reason why atherosclerosis and heart disease or blocks in coronary arteries occurs. Basically, whatever I mentioned about heart disease is the same for the entire vascular, cardiovascular system, including the brain arteries. Now, uh, you keep hearing a lot about the low-density lipoprotein, HDL, TG, etc. Now, very simply put, all of these, all these lipids, like LDL, HDL, and TG, they are uh, like uh, a bus, they are carriers. Just like a bus carries passengers from one point to another, they do the same thing. They carry vitamins and minerals and important, important nutritive things which are required for the cells of the body. That is all that they do. Now, the liver produces LDL and HDL both along with triglycerides. Now, the LDL, low-density lipoprotein, is when it is produced by the liver, it is in a large and fluffy form, which is good for us. It is only when this large and fluffy form gets oxidized because of inflammation that it turns into the small and dense LDL, which is the cause of problems. Unfortunately, we are not testing these. And also, whenever uh, a doctor finds a high level of LDL, they start reducing it by giving statin drugs, which is not the right thing to do because cholesterol is important for every cell in the body and so is the large and fluffy LDL as well as the HDL which is supposed to be the good cholesterol. Now along with this I also want to mention that wheat as I mentioned to you contains gliadin. The gliadin uh, you know, increases the, the gut permeability leading to leaky, leaky gut. The other thing is that the bacteria from the colon that is the large intestine which are meant to stay there they are sent up into the small intestine where they are not supposed to be at all. 
And uh, when they reach there, they start producing infection in that part of the gut, which he called as small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or fungal overgrowths. And at the same time, when these gut bacteria die, and they may have a very short lifespan, maybe a few minutes even, as they die, the cell wall releases a lot of toxins. So this gliadin leading to gut uh, permeability, changing the gut permeability, and this bacterial infection because of uh, the toxin being produced, by these bacteria is the basic cause why heart disease occurs. And I'm quoting Dr. William Davis on this. We've done a lot of work on this. Now, when we talk of wheat, we are not talking of wheat flour alone. We are talking of all the things that you see in the lower picture on the left-hand side. Now, wheat-related disorders cause heart disease because of many, many mechanisms. There's a lot of research to back it. Again, I'm quoting Dr. Tom on this, but I will not discuss this in, in detail for shortage of time. Sugar is, is another important factor because it feeds the bad bacteria in the gut. At the same time, when sugar is metabolized in the body, it extracts lots of other minerals like chromium. It extracts magnesium, zinc, cobalt, copper. Now, because of which, because of these deficiencies, these also have a detrimental effect on the heart. Now, I, I like to quote Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, who you, you've been hearing today. Uh, according to her, 28 atoms of magnesium are required to process one molecule of sugar. So remember, whenever you're eat, eating sugar, you're depleting yourself of other important minerals which are, which, are very, which are essential for the heart. It also raises triglycerides, which again decreases the, the good, uh, good cholesterol. It spikes sugar levels and sugar is addictive. All of these things, are, uh, they contain lots of sugar and are not good for us at all. Milk also contains a protein called casein, which behaves like gluten. It also has a lot of calcium, which is harmful for the heart. Excess calcium is very harmful for the heart. It contains lactose, and it may lead to lactose intolerance. There are many other impurities also present in milk. And there's a lot of talk going on with, uh, with the bad effects of pasteurization and homogenization. Now, vitamin D is also a very important factor for gut health as well as the heart because it has a role to play on the, the gut lining. Also, it is important for the health of the inner lining of the blood vessels. So if there's deficiency of vitamin D, it can lead to endothelial dysfunction and therefore heart disease. And also, again, I, I'm quoting Dr. C. Malhotra here, lack of adequate vitamin D is associated with almost a six-fold increase in heart disease. So vitamin D deficiency can lead to inflammation, dysbiosis, leaky gut, and heart disease. Magnesium deficiency is also a very important factor because magnesium is important for regulating blood pressure. It is important for keeping the muscles in, uh, in a relaxed state, including the heart muscle. It is also important for converting the inactive vitamin D into the active form. Therefore, deficiency of vitamin D is very detrimental to us. Low vagal tone is also contributing to heart disease, diabetes, and many other conditions. The vagus nerve plays a role in the production of hydrochloric acid. It is important for the movement of food from one part to the other in the intestine. This is called the process by which food moves is called peristalsis. So vagus regulates that. It is important for the function of the liver, the pancreas, and has a role to play in insulin metabolism also. <clears throat> So vagal, vagus nerve stimulation reduces insulin resistance. So this has been uh, seen in research. So I will not again discuss in detail. Stimulating the vagus nerve also decreases inflammation. So there's, there's a science behind this as well. So how do we manage uh, these conditions? Since leaky gut results because of uh, leaky gut and heart functions are interconnected because of the vagus nerve. So we have to, to address all three of them. The principles of management are re remove inflammation, detoxification, correct leaky gut, correction of insulin resistance, and stimulate the vagus nerve. Now, this generally falls into four categories. First, you've got to remove all the inflammatory food and stuff, restore the healthy microbe, re-inoculate, and repair. This is what we follow. So detoxification is very important because, as you can quite understand, if there are lots of toxins or things which are bad for you, they must be removed first. That is why Ayurveda advocates panch karma every three months at the change of season. This detoxification can be done at home. A lot, lot of things you can do at home, like oil pulling, dry brushing, 
massage before a, a shower outside outside the home you can go for far infrared sauna mud packs colon hydrotherapy there are lots of things you can do yoga pranayama meditation etc et are also important now to prevent further inflammation from taking place you got to reduce anything which causes inflammation that means the first thing is to avoid anti inflammatory avoid inflammatory food now you must remember that food means whatever we eat or drink it also means whatever we see whatever we hear whatever we think and whatever we feel these are according to the ayurvedic principles so all of these need to be addressed so stop consuming inflammatory food which means wheat sugar corn soy milk preserved food fast food packaged fried etc colas alcohol drugs like antibiotics they are very detrimental to the gut microbiome prolonged use of painkillers or antacids tobacco and going for living food like millets flax seeds coconut almond flour leafy greens naturally and locally grown organic foods if you must if you want to take sweet stuff then dates and figs could be all right nuts seeds healthy fats like ghee coconut or almond milk so these are all out avoid pesticides chemical fertilizers chlorine man made chemicals personal care products toothpaste so you must change over to those which are non chemical which are natural so try to be natural in all respects the principles of management as i mentioned are remove restore reinoculate and repair in this i would like to mention the role of pre and probiotics there are lots of them we always include them in our uh, in our armamentarium of managing the gut you need to correct insulin resistance which you can do by intermittent fasting and a ketogenic diet because healthy fats are very important both for the brain and the heart this is the schedule i generally follow but uh, due to shortage of time i shall not discuss this in detail so what should we eat lot of greens like green vegetables broccoli cauliflower arugula cabbage fruits like avocados berries ginger garlic onions spices fermented foods and nuts green tea is supposed to uh, it, it is important for the production of polyphenols and helps destroys bad gut bacteria vitamin d i already mentioned to you but here i would like to say that uh, i personally feel that a level of about 80 nanogram of vitamin d is optimal for for our health and therefore it has to be supplemented sunshine may not be enough though it has lots of other advantages but you have to go in for supplements of vitamin d fermented foods play a very important role and in india especially we have a few things which we which are like common in most homes like buttermilk and kanji then there are others like coconut kefir fermented vegetables cucumbers kimchi kombucha etc ghee plays a very important role because it produces butyric acid which the healthy bacteria love it is rich in soluble vitamins fat soluble vitamins like a d e and k it is a rich source of antioxidants and it conjugated linoleic acid turmeric as is common in our in our cooking indian cooking turmeric also is important now yoga is very good for the gut detoxifies the body by removing toxins through pranayam like breathing it removes mental alarm because it relaxes you once once you relaxed the toxin present in the mind and the brain also start leaving you it balances the chakra therefore it balances the energy levels in the body it stimulates the vagus nerve that is it promotes rest and digest vagal stimulation there are number of ways of doing it there are many like acupressure acupuncture there are many poses in yoga in yoga which which uh, stimulate the vagus nerve uh, specific pranayama like diaphragmatic breathing and humming bee pranayama meditation laughter therapy qigong gargling humming cold showers sun exposure walking in nature for at least 20 to 30 minutes and uh, chakra meditation meditation is of many types but chakra meditation especially on the solar plexus chakra which is the manipur chakra this is present behind the umbilicus and is especially important for both digestion as well as the circulation as you can see this is 10 petals one of the petals symbolizes uh, the, the gut function that is digestion and the other another one symbolizes cardiovascular system that is 
it, has, it regulates both in addition to regulating the entire system basically, but especially has a role to play on the, the digestive system as well as the heart. Therefore, keeping it in tone, keeping it in balance is important for both gut and the heart. Now, I'd like to mention my own story. In the year 2017, that is about seven years back, I uh, tested positive on a treadmill test. My coronary angiogram showed a block of 70% in my LED, that is the left anterior descending artery. No intervention was done as it was uh, deemed to be um, insignificant. Uh, my HbA1c was 5.8. My vitamin D level was 80. My vitamin D level was low. I was put on high dose statins, beta blockers, nitrates, and aspirin. A coronary angiogram was done in 2020. The LA lesion had regressed to 50, 50%, which happened because I stopped wheat, sugar, milk, refined, packed, and preserved foods. I cut down on potatoes and rice. I started eating millets, more of green vegetables, healthy fats like ghee, extra virgin cold pressed olive oil, cold pressed uh, coconut oil. I started doing 16 8 intermittent fasting. I ate two meals a day. I continued doing yoga, pranayama, meditation, and qigong. I uh, kept taking uh, magnesium and vitamin D. I have been off statins, aspirin, beta blockers, or nitrates, for that matter, any medications for the past few years. I do not have angina. My blood pressure is around 120 by 70. My HbA1c has come down to 5.2. My vitamin D levels are 80 nanogram per, per milliliter. I lost 18 kg in the process. I have increased uh, my energy levels and I feel absolutely fit. So to conclude, a problem in the gut manifests as a problem in the heart. Therefore, good gut health is important. A gut is like a fertile soil. We need to nurture it. Give it natural food and a natural environment. We are what we can digest. Therefore, foods, liquids, what we hear, see and think to is important. The right type of food must be consumed. No wheat, corn, soy, sugar, milk, refined, preserved, fast, packaged, fast foods, etc. Consumption of millets, green vegetables, naturally locally grown, seasonal food, foods which are as far as possible should be consumed. The four art principles should be followed. Correct insulin resistance and keep the vagus nerve healthy. Thank you very much. A very good evening and greetings to all eminent speakers and delegates from Mumbai. Gut health to my mind is an everyday investment for life. In this session, we are going to cover a number of chronic disorders. And what I'm heartened about is that most of these chronic disorders, what we picked up, are the ones you know which have gained a lot of importance in the recent times. Diet could strengthen or weaken the microbiota brain interaction or directly change the microbial diversity to influence the gut brain axis. The emergence of psychobiotics and a discussion on this new development should be the way forward for our discussion. In ensuring good quantity and good quality of sleep. There's a huge emerging science on gut skin axis, starting from the normal healthy skin to the skin associated diseases be it psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, acne. I'm very glad to share that in our institution, we are conducting two randomized control trials, one on sleep quantity and quality, and on the other one on acne. And both randomized control trials have a backdrop of food-based intervention and the effect of food-based intervention on these two aspects and I'm heartened to say that we are looking at gut microbiota and we are also looking at the skin microbiota. The role of diet, gut microbiota in the prevention of prediabetes and type 2 diabetes and the complications of diabetes has been very well documented. And to my mind as a nutritionist, 
exploring the role of gut microbiota to prevent prediabetes, to prevent hyperinsulinemia, to prevent insulin resistance, to prevent the, de the degree of inflammation in the body is an area which really need to be explored. And again, I'm very happy that this conference has a backdrop of use of millets. We've just celebrated the International Year of Millet last year. And we all today are very well literate about the beneficial nutritive and non-nutritive components in millets and how they can help facilitate a good gut environment. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back. And it is my privilege to introduce to you, for anyone who does not know Dr. Jill Carnahan, my dear friend, Dr. Jill Carnahan. What, what can I say about her? We're both teaching faculty at the Institute for Functional Medicine. She is such a wonderful clinician and so knowledgeable as a teacher. But as a clinician, she has a five-year waiting list. Patients want to see her as a new patient. It's a five-year waiting list because everyone just loves this woman and they love the results and how they feel with working with Dr. Carnahan. There are some secrets there that I'd like to pull out here in the next 20 minutes. So Dr. Jill, thank you so much for being here with us today. You're welcome, Dr. Tom. It is my honor and privilege oh, to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So people can learn, and in this conference, they're learning a lot of great information. It's overwhelming. There is so much. You know, if you hear just one speaker, you go, oh, that's a really good idea. And then you go home, you might be able to implement some of that. But when you hear 10, 12, 15 speakers, and they all have very good points of what they're making, how do we put priorities into what to do tomorrow morning? Where do you start with a patient when you know there's so much that they have to learn about? Tom, this is a great question because I say, see the patients even sitting in front of me and their eyes get wide and they're hearing all this great information and you know they want to feel better. Yeah. But when they hear all of these points and things, sometimes it can be absolutely too much to do. And then the easy thing to do is do nothing. So you sit there and because that's the easy answer, this is overwhelming, you shut it off and you do nothing. So what I like to do is find out what matters to you. Is it that you want to go on a, a, a mile hike with your granddaughter? Is it mm. that you want to sleep and wake up refreshed? And it's often the simple things of life, the connections with other human beings, with our family members, with our friends, with our pets. Um, or maybe it's you love to cook and create amazing meals for your family or friends. Or maybe you love to create, you're a writer or you're um, someone who reads and interprets or a journalist. And I could name a hundred other things. But what you want to do is find out what would make my quality of life better. Yes. And then you say, okay, this is my goal because that goal is something you're going to uh, allow yourself to be driven towards. It's not. It's going to be easier because you have an end goal. So let's say I want to walk a mile with my granddaughter once a month. Well, that goal requires us to put in place some habits. And what we can then do is go backwards. It's called reverse engineering. And we can say what habits, what daily things that we put in place would actually allow me to do the things that I love in life. And often people are exhausted or they have headaches or they have migraines or they have gut issues. So they can't cook the meals they love or hike with their granddaughter or do the creative things they love to do. So if we reverse engineer, then I can say, okay, I want to help you to your goal. And it starts with food. Food is medicine. So how do we incorporate daily habits of the things that you put as fuel into your body? If you had a sports car that was really expensive, you would not put the cheapest gasoline into it. You would choose premium fuel. And it's no different from our bodies. That's an excellent, excellent overview and a way of thinking of it. So you may focus, on, am I assuming with a large percentage of your patients, you will work with food selection as a place to begin? Yes. Okay. And here in India, we now have the year of the millet, where uh, the goal of the government is to educate people on the value of millet as a comprehensive grain. Where do grains fit in, in general, into your recommendations? Yeah, so obviously I'm a huge fan of a gluten-free diet. And of course, that's wheat, rye, and barley. That's why tummy. you're my friend. <laughs> <laughs> right. right, and we will go deep into that because, Tom, you are the expert there, and I'm sure you've taught all about that. But the bottom line is gluten is the most inflammatory food to our guts and creates intestinal 
permeability. It's like Swiss cheese or poke holes in the guts. And when that happens, of course, the immune system and inflammation can come into play. So when we talk about grains, grains are still good. They're full of nutrients. They're full of fiber. They're full of protein in many cases. And so these alternatives that are gluten-free like millet are excellent additions to the diet. And what we can do with these grains is still create things um, like meals that we would tor- normally do around the wheat or rye or barley, but instead we substitute something like millet. And India has one of the highest, if not the highest, rates of type 2 diabetes of any country in the world for a number of years now exponentially going up. So in educating our patients, one of the things that I like to do is educate patients that there's a really easy marker that they can use called your HOMA score, where you do a simple fasting blood sugar and fasting insulin. Then you plug it into this formula that you can get online. Just type in H-O-M-A, HOMA score, and you just plug the numbers in there and you see what your HOMA score is. And that is a measure of insulin sensitivity or insulin resistance. So could you tell us first about what is insulin sensitivity and insulin resistance and why is that important? Perfect. So the first thing is how to think of it when you're going to the grocery store or the local market or finding foods. If you find something in a package, you're already behind the game because it took a lot of work to process that food, to put it into a package. Whereas right. if you go to the farmer's market and you buy a bunch of fresh bok choy or you buy a bunch of uh, a, a pound of rice or millet or some grain, you're going to get that food as one ingredient. There's no label. And you're going to get better choices when you choose whole foods that are minimally processed. And typically, again, that's excess added excess fat, excess sugar. And what happens is those loads of excess sugar, for example, in a processed ingredient, uh, like a pasta or pizza or bagels or these kinds of things that are processed, also typically made with wheat, rye, or barley, those things go very quickly into our bloodstream as sugar. And that sugar spikes up and the body's meant to take that sugar out of the blood, deposit it into the tissues for use for energy. But what happens is the rate of that sugar matters. So if you get a bagel and jelly and a glass of orange juice in the morning, that's going to shoot your sugar up very quickly. And behind that, your pancreas has to work very hard to produce enough insulin to take that blood sugar back down to normal and put that in your body. So number one, that storage of sugar in your cells creates obesity and weight gain. Number two, that constant signal of more insulin, more insulin, more insulin wears out the pancreas, it becomes tired and exhausted, and eventually that's how diabetes comes into being. Mm -hmm. And some people have heard of this thing called the glycemic index. Can you tell us what that is and if it's a useful tool to use as a piece of information as to what foods to focus on for you and your family? Yeah, so this can be found online. You can find it anywhere you easy to find information. Glycemic index is the rate of that sugar So for example, if we took um, something very processed like a typical cookie or cracker versus a piece of broccoli, that cookie or cracker is going to have a much quicker rate of uh, insulin release and rate of sugar uh, rising in your body. So that's going to have a higher glycemic index. And you can actually look at foods based on glycemic index and choose things that are lower in glycemic index. One other really practical tool is the order of operations and how you eat your meal can make a difference. So if you eat your vegetables first, all of a sudden your stomach has lots of fiber, not a lot of sugar, and that will actually slow down if you later on have a little dessert or a couple, you know, glass of wine or something after dinner, you're going to slow down that rate of absorption of sugar as well. So you can even just eat your vegetables first, your Mm. protein and fat in the middle, and your carbs later. And that's another way to slow down the rate of glycemic index in your body. That's a really good point. Really good recommendation. Have your salad first or your vegetables first. And that's a, a, a really great takeaway that everyone can implement. One of the reasons I asked about glycemic index is because with the International Society for Celiac Disease, we've been teaching for a long time that wheat has a very high glycemic index. And it was shocking to see that a um, slice of whole wheat bread has a glycemic index of 74. And that's just startling because that's that, that's a high number. Right. Whereas a candy bar has a glycemic index of uh, 48. So wow. your body thinks you're getting more sugar with a slice of whole wheat bread 
than when you have a Snickers bar. Well, grains in general tend to be a little higher on the glycemic index, but millet comes in at 51. Wow. Now that's a safe number. Yeah. So one of the ways to help stabilize our blood sugar is by the selection of foods we're doing and how much sugar are in those foods or how much sugar our body thinks is in those foods, because there's not that much sugar in a slice of whole wheat bread, but it's the carbohydrates and and the the way the proteins don't digest very easily that causes this blood sugar spiking. But when we see that millet has a glycemic index of 51, that's an encouragement to include millet more often in our meals. Now, how many days a week do you think or recommend that your patients include grains in their meals? Well, for the general population who's trying to lose weight and stay healthy and um, maybe prevent diabetes, which it sounds like is our audience here for sure, yes. I think grains are a healthy part of a diet in general. And something mm-hmm. like millet or quinoa, millet, it'd be one of the best out there with this lower glycemic index. And typically what I'll say is what you want to do is avoid the processed grains, especially, and wheat, and instead have a cup of cooked millet. Um, as a side, that's a great way to get that into your diet. Um, and I would say most days of the week with your evening meal or your larger meal, it's perfectly appropriate. Mm-hmm. I agree with you. You know, it was startling. Um, a group out of Italy did a analysis of the glycemic index of gluten-free pastas. Yes. And they looked at 112, I think it was, I'm not sure, something like that, different gluten-free pastas. And the average glycemic index was 86. Some of them went up to 110. Uh, wow. So you're eating corn, rice combination, a spaghetti. Uh, well, there's no wheat in it. Well, right. it's healthy for me. Well, no, it's just not a poison for you, but it's, it's not necessarily healthy. That's why when we move more towards the whole grains like millet, which has a glycemic index of 51, it's so much better for us in the long run. It helps to stabilize our blood sugar. So the lower the glycemic index, the slower the food is digested in the intestines, which means that it lasts longer with just little bits of sugar going in, as opposed to the corn, rice, pasta, it's gluten-free, but it just flows into the bloodstream really quickly and the blood sugar spikes so high. And I agree with you. I think having some grains most every day is a good idea. And you you reference having your grains in the evening. Do you start your day with grains sometimes or are you more focused on evening consumption? So it really depends. We talk about glycemic index and the typical breakfast for at least Americans is cereals, right? And cereals mm-hmm. often, if they're not carefully chosen, like I choose a grain-free or a uh, millet, uh, amaranth, quinoa, gluten-free kind of cereal that's a very low glycemic. That's different, but your standard commercial cereals are incredibly high glycemic. Mm -hmm. And then you throw an orange juice and maybe uh, some milk on top, and you've got a thing that's just going to skyrocket your blood sugar in the morning. So because of that, I'm generally a fan of more savory foods in the morning. So you could still do you know, turkey and spinach and a side of quinoa or millet, um, in the morning. And often when you eat more of a savory meal in the morning, you keep that blood sugar stable all day long versus having a big spike. And then what happens if you do have that cereal and spike your blood sugar two or three hours later, you're craving sugar again. So you want to have a brownie or a package of M&Ms right. or something like that because your blood sugar is just a yo-yo all day long and you're following that. So how you start your day really, really makes a difference. And what do you mean by savory foods? Yeah, I like that term because it gets people to think differently than the sweet stuff that we're used to for breakfast. So Mm -hmm. when you think savory, it could be a lot of things, but it might be leftovers from the night before, like baked chicken and vegetables like asparagus and a side Mm -hmm. of millet. That would be a wonderful breakfast, and many people aren't thinking in those terms as far as breakfast. No, they're not. And and we're so accustomed to uh, continuing the eating style that we grew up with. If we grew up having cereal in the morning and orange juice, Uh, very common in the U.S., and I'm not sure how common in India, but uh, fairly common today in India. Uh, So if that's what we've grown up with, then we tend to always do what we've always done. And, you know, the old saying, if you keep doing what you've always done, you're going to get the same results. 
So we need to change something. So the idea of leftovers from the night before, perhaps, but having a piece of chicken, some vegetables, a little bit of the grain, a millet on the side, seems to me to be an excellent idea, just an excellent idea. Now, do you recommend smoothies for your patients, meaning throwing in a bunch of vegetables and fruits into a blender and blending it up? So I am a huge fan of smoothies because what can happen with that is you can get a lot of nutrition in a very easy kind of to-go kind of format. And a lot of times people are rushed for time in the morning. So to get something where they can get a jam-packed nutrient-dense food source. And what you can do is you can, even for kids, so as young as five or eight or three years old, you can make a smoothie with some berries, which are low glycemic relative to other fruits. You can throw in some leafy greens, which I think leafy greens are at the top of the totem pole for nutritional value, whether it's bok choy or arugula or uh, radishes or spinach or uh, any of those kinds of leafy greens are loaded with nitric oxide precursors, which helps us get blood flow to all the organs. They're loaded with nutrients, they're loaded with vitamin K. You can sneak those leafy greens in. So even if your toddler is not eating leafy greens, they get it in the smoothie. And then I like some sort of protein base. Nowadays, you can get these from plants or from all kinds of sources, whether it's pea or rice, or I do like a low glycemic option. And typically, um, I don't use soy. I'm not a big fan of soy and Mm -hmm. um, something that would be a little bit more nutritional. Even whey protein for those who are not sensitive is is appropriate. Um, The collagen powders, there's lots of things out there. So a base of some protein. And if you need more protein or more healthy fats, you can add avocado, you can add uh, walnut butter, pecan butter, cashew butter, even peanut butter if you're not sensitive. So adding those things and then throwing a little non-dairy milk, uh, coconut, almond, uh, cashew, oat, pick your kind, uh, no sugar added. Um, and it makes this wonderful nourishing um, drink. And then often as you and I prescribe supplements, we'll have someone add a little turmeric or add a little bit of creatine powder or add a little bit of amino acids or cilantro or there's so many wonderful things you can add in as these superfoods. In our home, we do these smoothies just like you've described. And what we discovered was that our son won't drink it, our three-year-old son, he turned three a couple days ago, Uh but he won't drink it if there's avocado in it. He he loves avocados, but if it's in a smoothie, he just doesn't like it. And it took a while for us to figure that out. But when we did, Marzi makes the smoothie and she pours his into a glass and then she adds the avocado for her and I. Perfect. So, so there's a way of making family smoothies, yes. you know, yes. that everyone will like, right? So you just have Love to it. experiment sometimes. Well, Dr. Jill, uh, we could easily just go on for an hour or more. Thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today and just share a couple of these pearls. Uh, my belief is if we walk out with a couple of ideas that are manageable, that we actually can implement to begin this whole process We're much more successful, and you've given us a number of them already today. Thank you so very much for being with us today. You're welcome. Well, hello and welcome back. And this interview is with my dear friend, Jeffrey Smith. Now, for those of you who have not heard of Jeffrey Smith, he is the founder and the executive director of the Institute for Responsible Technology. These are the people who for the last 15 plus years have been bringing out to the world the dangers of GMO foods and the chemicals used on our plants. Uh, Jeffrey has spoken in over 45 countries. He has met with three ministers of the central government of India and many state agricultural ministers uh, throughout India. He's been there many times and uh, is intimately knowledgeable about the status of the food supply in India. That's why we have him here today. Jeffrey, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Tom. So let's begin with the question, and I think everyone in our audience knows, but just so we're on the same page, can you tell us what GMO foods, what GMO, what does that mean? Genetically modified organisms. They take genes from one species and force it into the DNA of other species, or they rearrange the genetic code within a species. The primary reason that they genetically engineer crops has, traditionally is to spray them with Roundup herbicide, and they create Roundup-ready crops that won't die when sprayed with Roundup to kill weeds. 
So the Roundup will kill the weeds in the field around the plants, but it won't kill the plant. That's right. Because, because the plants have been genetically modified to withstand these toxic chemicals. And the Roundup, or its chief poison, glyphosate, gets into the plant and gets into the food portion, and we can't wash it off, so we consume high levels of glyphosate residues. And glyphosate, or Roundup, are also used on non-GMOs, beans and grains in particular, legumes, just before harvest to dry down the crops. So those two also have high levels of glyphosate. Glyphosate is one toxin I've been investigating in terms of its link to gluten sensitivity, cancer, and other problems. And GMOs also have toxic effects that we've been investigating. Now, one of the great achievements of agriculture in the last century was the development of dwarf wheat. That these dwarf wheat plants, they're much smaller in terms of their height, but they, they produce a heavier amount of crop, uh, the seeds that are made into flowers. Because the grains, the wheat before that would be much taller, and as it matured, the wind would blow it over, they'd break and they'd die, and they weren't able to be used. Is dwarf wheat a genetically modified plant? No. Some of the dwarf wheat was created through mutagenesis, exposing the seeds to radiation to change the, um, to create mutations, but not genetic engineering in the way that we use the word. Okay. And but when, when they grow dwarf wheat now, are they using glyphosate on most of those products? They use glyphosate in many areas just before harvest, three to five days, in fact, in the United States and Canada, and as well as in Australia. And that means that the wheat products that are eaten have high levels of glyphosate residues. And are those wheat products from Canada and Australia imported into India? Yes. In fact, that is one of the ways that Indian, the Indian population is exposed to glyphosate. Another are through lentils and mung beans in, uh, imported from Canada and Australia. In fact, there were 282 parts per billion and 1,000 parts per billion of the Mesor dal and the uh, Mung dal from Canada and Australia. And that compares to only 25 parts per billion on the domestically grown Indian. So it's 10 to 40 times higher amounts of glyphosate in the imported lentils and Mung dal, which means that the Indians are exposed to high levels of this very toxic herbicide. In fact, the government has now asked for rejection of those with high levels. They're trying to get testing, but we don't know how effective it is. Now, when the glyphosate is consumed, the World Health Organization has identified it as a class 2A carcinogen, but it's also linked to many other problems. As you know, it can cause the relaxing of tight junctions, causing leaky gut. It can suppress digestive enzymes. It can disrupt the microbiome because it is an antibiotic, and it can promote immune and inflammatory responses. These are all precursors to gluten sensitivity. So we have seen research in the peer-reviewed literature that glyphosate is linked to gluten sensitivity and celiac disease. But we also know that when glyphosate is eaten, is taken in conjunction with gluten, it can enhance the ability for gluten to create leaky gut because it reduces the activity of something called PPP4, which then allows for more of the leaky gut to occur. So unfortunately, we think that the use of glyphosate in the United States and around the world has been a primary driver of the explosion of gluten sensitivity and the Indian population is now being exposed. In fact, there's illegal Roundup-ready cotton being planted in India now, and that effort to try and make it legal, 
which has increased the use of Roundup. Roundup is also used on a number of other products illegally. It's allowed in tea gardens, but it's also found in a lot of imports. So for people trying to avoid glyphosate, seek organic foods and know the source of the foods that you're eating. That's, that's just so much information to take in at one time. Uh, I'm hoping people will have the opportunity to watch this again and listen to it again because it's critically important. In my presentation earlier today, I talked about all of the science that tells us that all disease begins in the gut. And so we do not want to do anything possible that is going to affect the health of the gut. We know that glyphosate will kill the good guys in the gut, encourage more growth of the bad guys in the gut. That's called dysbiosis. And so anytime we can reduce our exposure to this toxic chemicals that the World Health Organization classifies as a Category 2 carcinogen, anytime we can reduce our exposures to this, it's going to be of value. Let me ask you about the world of millet. Uh, our conference is to support the u more use of millet in our diets. And what do we know about millet with being genetically modified? Millet is not commercially genetically engineered. However, experiments have been done on millet to genetically engineer and alter the DNA since the 1990s. Now, in India, the approval process for GMOs has been widely criticized. I spent some time in the office of PM Bhargava, who was one of the leading scientists in the world, and we, I met him in his office, and he described how he was assigned to the Genetic, Genetic Engineering Appraisal Committee by the Supreme Court to do an evaluation. And after 10 months, he said the entire thing was a facade, that no GMOs were properly assessed by the GEAC in India or by any group around the world, and he recommended an immediate withdrawal of GMOs so that they could be subject to the serious toxicological tests and other tests that were needed. Now, since then, the Indian government has deregulated gene editing, which is a new form of creating genetic engineering, uh, and they've deregulated it under the false assumption that it is safe and predictable and natural. On our website at responsibletechnology.org, we have a six-minute animated video called Seven Reasons Why Gene Editing is Dangerous and Unpredictable. But because it is now deregulated in India, anyone can pick up millet or anything and gene edit the plant and release it and sell it and eat it. And this has very serious repercussions. We know that when genetic engineered products are released with the current safety assessments, some very dangerous products end up on the market. We have animal feeding studies showing all sorts of problems with genetically engineered corn and soy, for example. India released genetically engineered cotton and people reported and doctors reported that people get allergic reactions from simply touching the cotton. Animals that graze on the post-harvest cotton plants died by the thousands. I've interviewed people in villages where they have the itching and allergic reactions and their cattle died. We also know that the use of genetically engineered cotton in India, in some cases, has reduced the fertility of the soil, and the benefits of the genetically engineered cotton turn out to reverse over time, and it caused the, the massive farmer suicides, where about 250,000 farmers who are growing genetically engineered BT cotton took their own lives. And from leaked documents from the government and house-to-house -house surveys, we understand that the vast majority of those suicides resulted in the economic problems associated with failed genetically engineered cotton. There's also a reduction in the diversity of a, subs of a crop when it is picked up by commercial interests. India in the 1970s had 110,000 varieties 
of rice. Some say it was actually far more. Now it's about 6,000 because it got picked up by the Green Revolution, picked up by big ag or agro-industry, and they reduce the diversity. This is a problem if millet is taken up by the large concerns. They will advertise it and reduce the availability of other seeds as they have done around the world. And the diversity of millet, which is so important, can be threatened. Also, once you introduce a genetically engineered crop, you can't control the spread. It can cross-pollinate, it can be spread accidentally, and there's experience of that, of that around the world, in India and elsewhere, where once you introduce it, you lo lose control. The BT brinjal, which was introduced in India, ended up, it was supposed to be in just narrow field trials that were highly controlled. They found it illegally growing years later. The BT brinjal, which is genetically engineered to produce an insecticide, is available in Bangladesh, and we know from BT toxin that's now produced by the brinjal, it can actually poke holes in the cells of insects to kill them, and we know in high concentrations in laboratories, it can poke holes in human cells, possibly calling, causing intracellular leaky gut. We also know that the BT toxin promotes immune responses. All that allergic reaction we talked about from the BT cotton was probably from the BT, but we also have seen it in animal studies. We've seen it when BT was sprayed by plane in the United States and Canada. People have the same allergic reactions from the spray that the Indian farm workers were, were having when they touched the BT. So there's many reasons why we need to steer clear of genetic engineering. And unfortunately, the government of India has made an unscientifically supportable law that allows anyone to gene edit and introduce their product with no regulation. So let's hope that millet does not fall prey to genetic engineering, including the new versions of gene editing. Jeffrey, that was a profound overview. And there's a couple of points that I'd like to bring up from that. The first one is you and I have known each other for many, many years, and I've been a big supporter of the Institute for Responsible Technology because no one else was out there talking just the science as you have been for the last 11, 12 years or more. 20, 27, actually, Tom. 27 I know I don't look that old. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, but you've been talking about the science in many, many countries. Uh, it's just, just say, wake up, people. This is not as harmless as it looks when all the apples are perfectly designed the same size that they're, the genetic modification of our foods has detrimental side effects. Now your emphasis is on waking people up that anyone can change the genes in plants and perhaps animals. Anyone can buy the equipment, and it's... Uh, the CRISPR equipment. Some of us have heard of that technology. It's $2,000 in the U.S. So anyone can buy this equipment and in their basement, they can start messing around with genetics and creating plants that are genetically dangerous to normal healthy plants. Now, you gave me an example in the past of a genetic, genetically modified plant that almost got out into the wilds. Can you tell us about that? I think we're talking about a bacterium, actually, um, a genetically yes. engineered bacteria yes. that was engineered yes. to turn plant matter into alcohol. A well-meaning set of scientists said, let's distribute this to farmers who normally burn their crops after harvest. Instead, they can rake up the crops, put them in big barrels, with this genetically engineered bacteria, and it would turn the crops into alcohol, which they can use to run their tractors, to sell for additional money, and then take the nutrient-rich sludge at the bottom of the barrel and use it as fertilizer. Great well, concept. Great, great yeah, concept. You know, well-meaning, but one thing that we don't understand is what happens when you manipulate nature at this fine level 
you don't know the consequences. And a graduate student was doing research on this genetically engineered bacteria. And 10 days before it was scheduled to be released, he discovered that if it's mixed with soil, it will turn the plants into alcohol. It'll turn the roots into alcohol. It will render soil infertile. Once you release bacteria, you cannot recall it. It can spread. In fact, we have a film at responsibletechnology.org where we highlight this particular story. It's a film called Don't Let the Gene Out of the Bottle. And it describes how the United States Environmental Protection Agency did a secret study and found that genetically engineered bacteria can travel all over the world. So one of the things that the institute that I'm running is trying to do is to create a global ban on the release of any genetically engineered microorganism. Microbes, as you know, are critical for human health. They're critical for soil health. They draw down carbon from the atmosphere. Algae produces most of the world's oxygen. Fungal networks shuttle nutrients between trees. These are the microbiomes that are mission critical for life on Earth. Bacteria and other microorganisms exchange genes with each other. So if a high school student were to genetically engineer bacteria and release it, if it happens to survive and provides an advantage, that genetically engineered gene could be swapped and occupy 10,000 other types of microbes in 100,000 other ecosystems, including inside our gut, inside our mouth, on our skin, in the soil, and we could end up having catastrophes, even cataclysms, because of this unregulated new technology. So what so your, your, your emphasis is on regulation to have some guidance for this. We can't stop science, but we Correct. can certainly restrict who has access to make these changes. And I think that's a critically important concept. And so, Jeffrey, if there's a takeaway message to these dangers that are currently in India and all over the world, what would the takeaway message be? On an individual level, it's protect your food from the dangers of GMOs and glyphosate. On a collective level, it's to demand that now that this generation has the capacity to easily redirect the streams of evolution for all time by virtually anyone in their basement or in their school, we need to protect the nature of nature. Otherwise, this generation could replace nature with genetically engineered variants with, with that are prone to side effects. Whether it's bacteria, plants, or animals, we need to safeguard nature and we need to express that to governments and slow down the, de the deployment of the technology so that we're now studying it in contained facilities and not releasing it where it can never be controlled. Well, that's a very good message, and that's an actionable message that is not stopping science in any way, but just making sure that we're safe as this comes about. Jeffrey Smith, thank you so very much for your time and your vast knowledge. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Good morning, Dr. Varzi. Good morning. Pleased to meet you. Good morning. Very nice to meet you. It's such a privilege to have you with us in this conversation. You come with Thank so much, much of experience in the area of the gut microbiota and microbes. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your nice words. So Dr. Varzi, uh, Thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, we're looking forward to a very interactive and interesting discussion uh, for this next 30 minutes. So Dr. Varzi, my first question to you is that for centuries, bacteria have been dubbed, you know, as enemies of the human body. And yes. a sterile bacteria-free world was considered to be the safest. But we know that Dr. Eli Mechnikov, the founder of longevity and modern medicine, he suggested the use of beneficial bacteria to actually prolong life and reduce the risk of infectious diseases. So where do we align with Dr. Elimechnikov's theory today? 
Yes, that's very interesting. Uh, and uh, it's a, a key uh, topic of my presentation. Uh, many thanks uh, to you and uh, to the organizers uh, of the International Symposium Gut Health and Life Disorders for uh, your invitation. So, um, as you said, my name is Jean-Paul Warze. My background is medical doctor, and I have nearly 25 years experience in the microbiota and microbiotic fields. Um, Co-founder uh, of the SLP, I am also the nominated president. My presentation is about gut longevity and cancer. In the first part of my presentation, we're going to talk about Eli Mechnikov. As you said, the gut microbiota and health holobionts, epigenetics, and the first thousand days. The second part will focus on inflammation, the gut barrier, dysbiosis, leaky gut, and chronic complications. And in the third part of my presentation, we will talk about cancer prevention, diet and fasting, personalized nu nutrition and micronutrition, probiotics and microencapsulation, before highlighting the new perspectives with gut microbiota, FMT, probiotics and diet in cancer treatment and immunotherapy. Based on the important decrease of infectious diseases in the second half of the 20th century due to the medical innovations, vaccination and antibiotics, people could believe that a good microbe is a dead microbe. Today, we know that this is wrong. We are holobions. We are not on the top of a pyramid, but well in the center of the environment, exchanging permanently with the other ecosystems. More than 100 years ago, Mechnikov has discovered that some good bacteria can increase the life expectancy, and he has been granted with uh, a Nobel Prize. Mechnikov is a founding figure of longevity science. Due to the recent advances in the technology, metagenomics, qPCR, next generation sequencing, and in the bioinformatic tools, we have discovered recently that we have microbiota in nearly all the organs, the highest number of, micro of bacteria being in the colon. We are more bacterian than human. We are discovering every day new bacteria, anaerobic bacteria, and also their functionality. 80% of our immune cells are in the gut wall at, uh, at the end of the ileum. The permanent dialogue between the gut microbiota and the immune system, as from the birth, takes care for the education and maturation of the immune system and for the food tolerance and tolerance of the good bacteria. The gut immune system in, is interconnected with the immune system of the other organs, for example, through the gut lung axis. Based on the international research, we know each day more and more about the gut microbiota and its role in human health. This conductor of our internal physiology is, among others, working on three main health pillars. First of all, on the digestion, resorption, metabolism, and detoxication. Secondly, on the immune system and gut barrier, playing an important role for our defense and the, and the tolerance. I mean, food tolerance and the good bacteria tolerance. And thirdly, through the gut-brain axis, it influences the mood, the pain perception, and the society. The gut microbiota is a real team producing key metabolites for our health like short-chain fatty acids and working for us 24 hours on 24. The gut microbiota diversity is key. Butyrate is the most known short-chain fatty acid as communication metabolite. It plays an important role on the three pillars, having uh, also other important health effects like inflammatory effect, epigenetic effect, et cetera. The gut microbiota is specific to the person, stable and resilient with disruptive periods due to infections and antibiotics, for example. Three enterotypes are influenced by the nutrition, Femicates and bacteria data as being dominant phyla, besides other subdominant or passage bacteria, each person having a specific team taking care for the job. The gut microbiota imbalance is called dysbiosis, diversity and functionality being key and more important than quality and quantity of the bacteria. Besides age, 
Besides age, stress, infections, antibiotics, unbalanced diets, industrial food, food additives, intensive sport are important dysbiosis factors by the adults. And this besides the drugs like proton pump inhibitors, anti-inflammatory drugs, laxatives, and also endocrine disruptors. <laughs> Dysbiosis can cause symptoms, but this without relationship of proportionality. The gut microbiota is resilient and this in certain limits. Acute and long-term dysbiosis factors being able to lead to another stable state with potential disease development. The gut microbiota imbalance is associated with a variety of chronic diseases and cancer. This model shows the different steps from dysbiosis to leaky gut, followed by the resorption of LPS in the toxins, membrane, fragments of gram-negative bacteria, real inflammatory bombs, creating inflammation locally, but also at distance. Understanding the role of trillions of bacteria, viruses, and fungi that comprise the human microbiota is critical to enhance our understanding of these modern human diseases. A well-balanced microbiota between pro- and anti-inflammatory strains, together with optimal levels of vitamin D, are key for an efficient gut barrier in order to avoid leaky gut syndrome, inflammation, and its chronic complications. The gut microbiota by elderly people is changing with less bifidobacteria and lower diversity. The dysbiosis is being also influenced by the impaired nutritional status specific to the elderly and resulting of their food habits, limited physical activities, and also due to their drugs. Immunosenescence by elderly people increases susceptibility to infections and pro-inflammatory conditions. Besides, they have reduced gut motility and digestion capacity, which increased gut permeability contributing to the development of inflammaging. Inflammaging is the aging inflammatory theory proposed as from the year 2000, a systemic chronic, low-grade, and sterile inflammation, becoming detrimental in the post-reproductive period of life. You see here on the left the different triggering factors of the systemic chronic inflammation, also specific of elderly people, dysbiosis, leaky gut, obesity, unbalanced diet, stress, disturbed sleep, chronic infections, lack of physical activity, chronic infections, xenobiotics, and on the right side, the consequences like cancer and other multimorbidities resulting from this systemic chronic inflammation, immunosenescence, metabolic problems, cardiovascular diseases, autoimmune diseases, sarcopenia, depression, neurogenerative diseases. Here, we see a few, few publications related to inflammation and cancer and other consequences and comorbidities. On population level, we find a heterogeneity of immune responsiveness and inflammation, the early life events during the first thousand days being determinant. Maternal lifestyle and environmental exposures refer to exposure. These factors like poor access to healthy foods, housing insecurity, psychological stress, and poll polluted air can influence the programming of the immune system of the offspring, potentially leading to a more pro-inflammatory phenotype later in life. In this recent publication, inflammaging original concept has been integrated in the latest scientific developments. Numerous stresses contribute to the lifelong shaping of immunosenescence and inflammation through various pathways. The resulting mediators and modulators dependent on the physiological threshold will lead either to longevity or pathological aging with concomitant role of genetics and environment epigenetics. The processes are time dependent and define the underlying concept of immunobiography. In the New Age project, One Year Mediterranean Diet promotes epigenetic rejuvenation. Mediterranean diet information alters the gut microbiome in all the people, improving the health status and reducing frailty. 
In this 2021 publication, gut microbiota targeted diets modulate human immune status. Fermented food diet increases microbiome diversity and decreases markers of inflammation. High fiber diet changes microbiome function and elicits personalized immune responses. In the United States, the first ever randomized controlled trial, the calorie trial in, in this 2023 20, publication, showed uh, in healthy adults the effect of long-term caloric restriction on DNA methylation measures of biological aging. In this other recent 2023 publication, the author makes the difference between the gut microbes boosting the immune system and regulating inflammation in metabolic diseases and other microbes contributing to metabolic diseases. Besides, on the right side, it highlights the positive effects of time-restricted eating contributing to the alignment of circadian rhythm with host metabolism. We go towards personalized interventions in microbiota to support healthy aging, a healthy lifestyle with a balanced diet rich in re unrefined foods of natural origin, together with adequate physical exercise, aerobic or combined, sustained for sufficiently long periods, allows for restoration and maintenance of a healthy microbiota, even in old age, promoting healthy aging. The use of supplements must be targeted, individual, individualized and calibrated on the needs of the individual subject. And appropriate strategies must be implemented to maintain the restored microbiota. Probiotics are live microorganisms, which when administered in adequate amounts, confer a health benefit to the host. Specific probiotics take care for pathogen exclusion reinforcement of tight junctions and gut barrier, modulation and permanent training of the immune system. Most common genera are lactobacilli and bifidobacteria. Then the strains need to be chosen according to the scientific documentation in human health related to indication, target groups, dosage, and duration of use. Probiotics being live microorganisms, the quality of the product is crucial Microencapsulation technology contributes to the strain's protection as from the production and during the duration of life against moisture and high temperature, and after ingestion against stomach acidity and biliary salts before release and revification into the colon and delivering the health effects. The revised 2023 edition of the WGO Probiotics brochure, coordinated by Professor Francisco Guarner, that we see here um, on the photo, is available on the World Gastroenterology website. Gut microbiota has a great influence on the gastrointestinal cancer. We, we have here several publications from the years 2010. Uh, related stomach, liver, and colorectal cancer. But gut microbiota is also associated with clinical stages of breast cancer and also with lung cancer. Aging being changing the microbiota diversity and being a major risk factor of cancers, microbiota could modulate the efficacy and the tolerance of oncological treatments. For example, the incidence of gastrointestinal toxicity and infectious disease. The intestinal microbiota could be considered as a biomarker of frailty that could be used to optimize cancer management in elderly patients. For example, modulation of gut microbiota to enhance the effect of checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy. Due to the considerable relationship with immune checkpoint inhibitors, the changes of gut microbiota during immunotherapy, bacteria able to enhance anti-tumor effect and bacteria biomarker of immunotherapy for distinguishing responders and non-responders. Today, there are three major ways in which the gut microbiota is used in tumor treatment. First of all, oral probiotics. And we see here, the different uh, bacteria that has been used together with immunotherapy. Uh, 
Another way in which to get microbiota is used in tumor treatment is diet information in, in intervention. And we have here a publication becomes, uh, related to uh, the use of dietary fiber and probiotics concerning uh, immunotherapy also. And finally, uh, we also have fecal microbiota transfer, uh, which is also regularly used um, uh, associated in immunotherapy. And um, we, uh, we expect a lot of uh, um, positive uh, solutions through these three ways of intervention. So my presentation at the beginning has been talking about gut health and longevity. And um, we did put the accent on the uh, important role of Eli Mechnikov. And we highlighted the role of gut microbiota in health and also the importance um, um, of the first thousand days. Afterwards, we, we've been talking about dysbiosis, inflammation and cancer. And uh, we highlighted the, the importance of gut barrier. And also, the, we uh, explained inflammation and uh, the important role of inflammation in the development of systemic chronic uh, complications and cancer. And finally, we've been talking about um, uh, new solutions that um, we can we, we can propose to elderly people uh, in order to avoid the development of these chronic complications um, through fasting, caloric restriction, uh, Mediterranean diet, and other um, tools. Uh, very important to um, rebalance the, the microbiota like probiotics and micro uh, encapsulation of micro uh, of probiotics but uh, but also um, the different tools are very important to uh, reinforce the the gut barrier the, the related to clinical biology we we see more and more developments uh, and uh, we can expect to to get more and more in very interesting tools in order to personalize the, the, the solutions proposed to the patients and um, uh, related to nutrition and micronutrition. And we have been talking about uh, the new perspectives in cancer treatment, uh, especially with immune checkpoint inhibitors. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Varzi. That was an excellent presentation. And uh, I think, yes, the gut microbiota is playing a significant role in almost more than 25 disorders today, and cancer is one of them. So thank you, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. But uh, uh, are there any studies which have highlighted the, uh, the presence or the over-representation of any group of bacteria in, uh, say, cancer? I did. I didn't uh, understand uh, clearly your question. Sorry. So we now have uh, we now now know that gut dysbiosis plays a very very important or is linked to the pathogenesis of cancer. But yes. are have there been any studies to identify signature bacterial species or signature metabolites which are seen in cancer patients or observed in cancer patients? Yes, absolutely. So this is uh, this knowledge is in uh, is growing. But uh, I'd say um, what, what we are uh, learning day after day concerning the the um, the well balanced uh, microbiota, but also the specific conditions uh, in terms of cancer and depending on the cancer, we we are uh, learning each day more and more related to to the presence of specific bacteria in specific cancers. And also the the, the influence uh, sometimes, as I did um, say, uh, related to specific gastroenterology cancers of um, lung cancer and so on. And um, we also, um, in one of my slides, um, uh, I did also present um, a group of bacteria which were, um, that was perceived as having a positive influence uh, uh, against development of inflammation and other the bacteria having more influence for the development of inflammation. Yes, uh, there is, yes, a lot of scientific data that has shown that there are certain bacterial species like Fecalibacterium prosnitsi, which is yes. a butyrate producer and has an uh, impact on reducing inflammation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so how about FMT? You were talking about fecal microbiota transplants. You think it could be one of the therapeutic options for treatment of cancer? 
That's a very good question. Uh, I think uh, there are a lot of expectations concerning FMT uh, due to the very good results uh, that we get in case of uh, multi-resistant, uh, multi-resistance um, uh, antibi antibiotics, multi-resistance, and um, uh, chronic diarrhea due to uh, Clostridioides um, difficile. Um, but um, uh, related to FMT, I'd say. Um, in oncology, I think this this solution uh, uh, we, we we can expect from FMT a lot of um, um, inf positive influence uh, concerning the efficacy of uh, in, uh, in uh, especially in immunotherapy and um, um, different uh, teams are developing um, um, FMT uh, analog solutions uh, as already available in the states. Um, but we, we expect that FMT could be replaced also by uh, solutions with 100 bacteria, uh, lyophilized uh, li um, um, and, and available in, in capsule, which is um, on cultural level uh, easier to, to use than real FMT. Real FMT. Yeah, because there is still a question about the staying power and the optimum protocol for an FMT. At this point, yes. I think there is it. Although there has been a lot of benefit in Clostridium difficile infection and also in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, but I think it's still we are still in the early stages where we can use it as a treatment option. Uh, so, uh, having said that, Dr. Varsi, also you know interventions which can favorably modulate the gut microbiota, like say probiotics, prebiotics, symbiotics, and by we now also have postbiotics. Uh, yes. what what do you what is your take on these interventions for possibly reducing risk of cancer given that it is the second leading cause of death in the world cancer I think we can expect a lot uh, from the new bacteria like Fecalibacterium progenesi um, uh, related uh, positive influence uh, on on the well on, um, in order to keep a well or to rebalance or to to keep a, a balanced uh, microbiota. Um, I, I think the diet and, and uh, probiotics through soluble fibers and uh, also polyphenols and uh, omega uh, omega three uh, also with their anti uh, anti inflammatory effect. Um, um, participate a lot. Uh, can participate a lot to 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 this fight uh, in prevention uh, and also in in uh, association of uh, cancer treatment. Uh, related to postbiotics, postbiotics is a new definition, which is a, uh, uh, um, a definition where we we find a lot of solutions. I'd say, um, and uh, I I think we still have to see how this concept of postbiotics will evaluate compared to um, well-defined uh, concept uh, as probiotics and prebiotics. Symbiotics also is a very interesting uh, solution in case of demonstrated documentation uh, in, 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 uh, in human health because uh, this association must um, must must be well functioning. Uh, we have to demonstrate it, and uh, so I think that uh, probiotics, prebiotics, the new the new probiotics also, and and um, and um, maybe the the postbiotic concept uh, will will certainly participate uh, to to this uh, in, in this field to to added value. And uh, as I did say in my presentation, we have today three main um, tools uh, which are used, probiotics, and of course, uh, prebiotics uh, together the, uh, with diet and uh, also FMT. And uh, all those new concepts emerging from the extension of the probiotic segment will certainly um, bring added value to uh, the, the current tools we have today, absolutely. Yes, uh, I agree with you, Dr. Varzi, but probiotic benefits are also strain specific. Yes. And there is a lot of there is a lot of confusion in the market about generalizing probiotic strains. You know. <laughs> probiotics, uh, probiotics. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, it's very important to talk uh, about um, the fact that if we talk about probiotics, we, we talk about uh, live microorganisms with a DNA, a specific DNA, uh, specific to the bacteria, and the DNA is the basis of the functionality of the bacteria. And so each bacteria is different. And uh, based on this, 
uh, it's very important to, to have a specific do documentation linked to specific bacteria. And we, when we talk about specific bacteria, we, we talk about the three levels of denomination, genus, species, and the level of bacteria, like, like yes. Bacillus spinosis GG. And uh, in order to make the link between the specific bacteria we, we should use and that, we, that which is described on the packaging and uh, to be able to, to, to have a look to the documentation where the three levels of denomination have to be found uh, uh, to make the link between the documentation in human health and the bacteria. And something very important uh, is certainly the documentation, not only for the strains, but also in case of association of strains. Because because uh, the, uh, one strain used alone can have uh, uh, an anti-inflammatory effect and together in presence of uh, specific um, pro other, other strains or even prebiotics, this strain can become uh, can have can get an effect uh, pro-inflammatory. So it's very important yes. to, to use a specific specific uh, strains in specific indications, based on the, uh, the the guidelines and the recommendations. And that's why I, I recommend also um, this, this folder about probiotics uh, revised in 2023 by the, the World Gastroenterology Org Organization, which is a very interesting tool um, to, to see also in which indications uh, probiotics can be used today. Yes, even in India, we have a lot of discussion around a single strain probiotic and a multi-species or strain uh, probiotic. But like you said, the synergistic effect of the prebiotic, probiotic, or the probiotic combinations becomes extremely important. Absolutely. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So there's a lot of science. It's evolving. People are beginning to understand, you know, what these interventions are really doing for you in the gut. And gut health and leaky gut are terms that we are using very, very frequently in almost all disease conditions. But Absolutely. my one question, I'm going back to what you said about the first thousand days, critical for the development of the child, for you know its lifelong health. So are there any global recommendations for uh, ensuring a well-balanced gut microbiota in the first thousand days as a part yeah. of the diet program? That's a very uh, good question. Uh, you know, the, uh, something very interesting in, in Europe, uh, um, uh, we have a high, high level of allergy and based on this, um, allergy prevention is becoming a priority of the European community. And uh, it's very interesting to see that in the different uh, practical recommendations from the European community, they talk about humans um, as holobionts. Holobionts, uh, yes. So it means, it means that um, the, the um, governments uh, are recognizing the import, the crucial role of microbiota. And uh, I think th this is a very important step uh, towards the, the further development of this new science towards uh, all levels of uh, healthcare professionals, because today, um, if I take, for example, uh, Belgium and uh, uh, some other European countries, the students in medicine don't get any information about microbiota, which is uh, totally incredible. So uh, I, I'd say um, the world, uh, the WHO uh, is supporting a lot this uh, concept of uh, thousand first days, uh, first thousand days. And uh, uh, I, I think that this concept is entering uh, the, the, the healthcare professionals busy with the pregnancies, um, um, uh, midwives and gynecologists and, and, and so on. And I think that um, this uh, recognition is, uh, is growing. And uh, but I, I we we can't say today uh, if if we talk about the European vision we can't say today that microbiota and probiotics and all the microbiotics do have today the um, 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 in the daily practice the position at the same level um, um, of uh, what we see in in the. In, in the documentation, in the scientific documentation. I mean that uh, we, we still have a lot of work in order to, to implement uh, this, yes. these new concepts in the daily practice of all levels of healthcare professionals. Absolutely. 
But Dr. Marzi, when is that going to happen? <laughs> We've just been talking a lot of science, but we are, when are we really going to implement this into real practice? Yes. I think it's it's still some way away. But I was okay. reading a very interesting paper on uh, this uh, study, which was done on 46 pregnant women, and where they showed that, you know, in the third trimester, the gut microbiota of a pregnant woman is literally like that of an IBD mm -hmm. patient. And when the gut microbiota is transplanted into germ-free mice, the mice actually gain weight, have insulin resistant resistance and pro-inflammatory cytokines. So uh, do you think an intervention in the third trimester during pregnancy with any one of these so-called interventions for modulating or favorably modulating the gut microbiota could be a useful addition? I, I think the, uh, we are discovering day, uh, day after day uh, more and more uh, the, 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 the role of um, the mother's microbiota on the development of the fetus. And uh, um, we have been discovering recently uh, the presence of a lot of microbiota in the placenta. And, and um, I, I'd say, I, I think that uh, it's, it's uh, recognized that um, metabolites produced by the microbiota do influence the development of the fetus. And uh, we, we, we have more and more uh, scientific documentation in human health showing that intervention during the pregnancy with specific uh, strains can influence uh, the development and, and um, can have a positive role in the prevention of allergy, of, uh, in, in prevention of uh, metabolic problems uh, in case of uh, risk uh, factors. For example, of uh, gestational uh, uh, diabetes, diabetes. Um, and and so uh, I'm uh, I'm convinced that uh, we are uh, we, we are developing um, stronger and stronger uh, data uh, in order to let evaluate the 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 practice the daily practice uh, also during the pregnancy, and um, I, I think that. Um, we, we can say today that based on, on the current documentation existing, we have a lot of um, uh, indications, I'd say, where uh, probiotics could be used, uh, first of all, in order to uh, prevent um, 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 uh, vaginosis, uh, bacterial vaginosis during the, the pregnancy and avoid uh, prematurity, for example. Um, um, uh, related to also treatment of urogenital infections dur dur during the, 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 the pregnancy, but also uh, the prevention of allergy. Um, and uh, um, I, I, I'd say influence on the three main pillars I was talking about, digestive, immunity, and also good brain axis. And uh, I, I think that the pregnant woman um, should get a lot of advantages of um, getting um, 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 recommendation for having specific and documented uh, probiotics or microbiotics during this period. Absolutely. Yes, like you said, now the placenta and the amniotic fluid, which were believed to be sterile, are bathed with microbes. So the development of the GI tract and the immune system of the newborn actually begins when in the intrauterine environment. So that's very interesting. That's very, very interesting. And uh, I mean, Dr. Varzi, there is a lot to do, yes, when it comes to gut health, the leaky gut, probiotics, prebiotics. But like you said, I think scientific validation is going to be key in seeing the progress of these interventions as, you know, part of your recommendation. So scientific validation is going to be very, very important. Absolutely. Uh, you have to know that in Belgium, incredible but true, but um, the leaky gut is, is, not, uh, is not yet uh, really recognized by the, uh, most of the gastroenterologists. <laughs> but here in India, we are uh, progressing <laughs> and we do talk about the leaky gut and we actually see that, you know, if the leaky gut is gut dysbiosis and leaky gut, both of them are... Uh, very important factors for the pathogenesis of several disease conditions. Absolutely. So it's been wonderful talking to you, Dr. Varzi. Thank you so much for your time. And we would be delighted to host you in India whenever you come to India. And, uh, you know, it will be a real pleasure. 
So thank, thank you, you so much for your for you. It was a pleasure. Have a nice thank you, have a thank nice you so much for you. Thank you so much for your time. Bye.